What's going on everyone? My name is Nicholas Merton here at Datadash and today is March 6 of 2020. Well folks, I hope you are having a fantastic day wherever you are. And in today's video, I want to spend some time to dive through and talk about a market that may seem boring to many, but is probably one of the most important things to understand if you want to understand what's going to drive not only gold and silver, but also Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies alike. All right, so we've got a lot of interesting data pieces to dive through today, guys. Let's go ahead and get right into it and start by taking a look across the board in crypto markets. So over the last 24 hours, Bitcoin and Ethereum, relatively neutral, but at the moment we are seeing, again, a good amount of altcoins here picking up steam. One of our plays here, Kyber Network, as well as a variety of other plays like Waves and Hedera, Hashgraph doing well. But the broader market right now in a no-trend scenario, not making much moves over the last 24 hours. But I want to go ahead and really dive into focusing here on Bitcoin now. As always, we're going to be focusing here on the weekly chart because quite frankly, to me, that's all that matters, guys. We don't need to look at the daily. We don't need to look at the hourly. Here on this weekly chart, we can see what's coming up here over the next coming months. We are coming towards an inflection point for cryptocurrency markets, and it's more clear than anything through Bitcoin's chart. We can see through the line of resistance that takes in the last two significant highs here for Bitcoin that we get a general line of resistance that is putting us into a coiled scenario between the line of support here that's been building since back here as far as 2015. We've been setting up for this point for a very long time, and there's a reason that price is coiling in here between these two two very significant levels of support and resistance. And that's because it's building up towards an inflection point for the halving event that's coming up sometime here in May. And when that halving event comes, it's going to reduce the issuance of new Bitcoin every 10 minutes on average. And this is going to be a really big supply shock to the current daily supply and demand side for Bitcoin between buyers and sellers. As many of you might know, as we've talked about here on the channel, the halving event, even though it's well known and, uh, you know, in a sense, would be uh, questionably priced in, it can be priced in because that daily change in supply and demand cannot take effect until we actually get the supply reduction. And again, we're a niche audience of people, guys. Most people don't understand what's going on in this market, what Bitcoin is, and what the halving event is, give or take, right? So anyways... We've got this inflection point here. Bitcoin's chart has been showing us that we're setting up for this next cycle to not only break past this line of resistance and also the previous highs at 20,000, but also to charge to new highs at $50,000, $80,000, $100,000, $200,000. have heard price targets that go to very exorbitant levels. And the thing is, as much as I have much more conservative estimates of around 100 k for this next cycle, um, you know, again, I try to keep my estimates as conservative as possible. I wouldn't doubt that it's possible to see Bitcoin test 150,000 or 200,000 because the halving in this case sparks a new cycle. And we're seeing the buildup right here in the early phases. And just take a look at the previous halvings, right? We've got a great chart here that showcases the last halving event, taking in the last highs of the bear market, showing the correction here, the bottom that Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin built around $200. And then afterwards, the uh, continued increase in price leading up to the halving event, this minor, this minor correction that we get after the halving event, and then afterwards, the parabolic cycle that led us from around $1,000 upward towards $20,000, a 20x in Bitcoin's price. So it's not too crazy to think that we're going to see Bitcoin test back up to its previous highs and do something like a 5x, right? Because if we take into account Bitcoin's previous highs of $20,000, we are only doing a 5x if we go to $100,000. That's one fourth of what we did back when we reached the previous highs at 1,000 and went to 20,000. So the multiples are getting smaller, but a 5X in a matter of a year, a year and a half is a pretty good deal, right? It's, it's not something you can find in just about any other market. But keeping this in mind, we're seeing a lot of correlations here with the previous halving event, with the price action that we saw in the last cycle and what we're seeing here over the last past weeks in Bitcoin's price. So it's very important to see these correlations, but it's not just confident. We're not just seeing confidence in the sense of Bitcoin's price. We're also seeing confidence in the sense of altcoin markets. Now, we're taking a look here at a reversal of Bitcoin dominance, which signals to us how much dominance altcoins own in the market, which is a really, really interesting chart here. So altcoins currently make up 35% of the overall market capitalization for crypto. Now, some of you might theorize in this case that, you know, because altcoins are gaining in this case, uh, you know, or maybe, for example, during an event where Bitcoin is having a having in its reduct, um, having in the sense of its supply increase per block, that this would be a difficult environment for alts to keep up with Bitcoin. 
And I would usually say on a logical basis that makes sense. But if we look historically back at the previous chart here where it showcases the having event happened back in June of 2016, we can see here, taking a look at the chart, this is actually when altcoins started to pick up their initial phase of dominance going all the way from 1.6% up here to 4.4%. And then afterwards, back here a couple of months later, we saw one of the greatest on risk rallies that we've ever seen in any market in history. I mean, the multiples were crazy, guys. Um, so again, it showcases here that I think as we're building into this wedge here on the chart, really taking into account some of the support range here for this price range and also the line of resistance here, building a line of support and a line of resistance, we're able to see that we're coiling in for that next breakout. We're going to see a lot more risk taking. Again, nowhere near the multiples that we saw last time, but through a select few players, we're gonna see a lot of risk taking and a lot of higher valuations in the market. Now, this is kind of, again, what the TA and kind of price action side of things are showcasing to us, what the data science models are showing. Why is it that Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies are going to move higher? I know it's a very bold claim to say that crypto is going to yet again have another parabolic cycle, and let alone, see risk on assets continue to rise as we're entering towards a much more kind of negative scenario when it comes to traditional markets. And that's kind of the topic we want to talk about today. I want to talk about why Bitcoin, as well as gold and silver, are going to serve as the leading hedges on a global stage in order to hedge against the failure of the ballooning debt market across the world, and more specifically, the ballooning bond market which has been in a bull market for the last few decades, but is now getting to a point where eventually we're going to have to start asking some very, very tough questions. And that is gonna be whether or not we can live in a world of negative yields. Now, if you guys know about bonds, you would know that bonds usually provide you a positive yield because a bond is an IOU. You're basically allowing the government, in this case, to borrow your capital in order to finance, in this case, its expenditures, right? And in this case, you're getting a debt note, a promissory note, an IOU from the government that provides some kind of yield, thanking you, in a sense, for giving them cash in the short term and taking on that risk that they could default to not pay it back. It's the exact same form of debt in a sense that when you go to the bank, right, you know, in the sense if you take out credit, right, there's an IOU in this case. You know, we, I, we have an IOU to the bank in this case. We're spending money that we owe eventually back to the bank in order to make sure that we're credit worthy and, you know, we pay back our debt and hopefully can borrow more in the future. Well, in the sense of the twilight zone that is the current modern financial system, we now have negative yielding debt. And this has been a phenomenon that's really spawned out of the sheer fact that in this case, uh, governments, not only through central banks, have lowered interest rates to near zero, but along with that have taken on excessive amounts of debt to finance government expenditures and hopefully expand the underlying economy. Now, they've failed at this to a pretty large degree. I think many of you could look outside your back window and see that uh, even though you're hearing great numbers of economic growth, you're not really seeing it in the economy. And it's really been ballooning an asset bubble and a lot of other different types of uh, ill-minded Ill uh, kind of symptoms, I think, or just all kinds of uh, terrible symptoms in the economy that aren't really leading to actual economic growth. But if we take a look here, right, we see a growth here in the purple line of negative yielding bonds. This was a phenomenon that really expanded back here from September 2018 to the summer 2019. And after having a correction, it almost seemed like this experiment was going to end. But suddenly, in January of this year, we got a sudden resurgence of over $3 trillion more in negative yielding bonds. And interestingly enough, notice how the black line here, which is Bitcoin's price, or excuse me, uh, gold's price, and then also the golden line down here, this orange is goldish line, uh, saw an increase as well, over 50%. In this case, it's Bitcoin's chart. And we're seeing a correlation between the increase in gold and Bitcoin to negative yielding bonds. This is not being talked about. It's one of the most significant charts that I could probably point you guys to. And it showcases that people are looking for hedges that even though they don't provide a yield, are not providing a negative yield. And also, in this case, are serving as a hedge in case of default on these IOUs, these government treasuries. And I think we're gonna get to a point here where a lot of people are going to start looking for these hedges. I think the price action already proves that. This near direct correlation with gold's price to negative yielding bonds. I mean, you can see here, gold's rally really started back here in September of 2018. And it stagnated after we saw a decline in negative yielding bonds. Right? 
So we've seen this balloon here. Uh, we've seen as well that it's made up of different security types. So there's different types of bonds. It's not all just treasuries and sovereign debt of governments, right? It makes up the majority. It's more than three fourths. But we also have other government related debt. We have corporate debt and then also securitized debt, right? And then the majority of this is being made up in a few economies across the world. It's mostly in Japan and the EU. Uh, you have, for example, Japan making up nearly $5 trillion, almost half of the entire debt pile, alongside Germany and France, the rest of the EU making up about 16%, and the rest of the world starting to join in and make up a larger portion of the pie. This is going to continue growing. That's the key thing to keep in mind, guys. The rest of the world here is going to be the dominant force here, right? Because Japan's played a big role here. The EU has now started to enter into this, this experiment of negative uh, yields on bonds and negative interest rates. The rest of the world will join soon enough. Do not doubt it because all central banks operate in a monetary system that has the exact same flaws, right? It's important to keep in mind they might work under different labels. The bonds will be called different things. In the U.S., they're called treasuries. Uh, and then also they'll lay behind different labels and different countries and economies. It doesn't matter. Everyone will join suit into this pursuit of negative rates. And that's an important thing to talk about when it comes to the U.S. Because when the U.S., the world, uh, the world leader of the economy, the place where we have the reserve currency, when the U.S. enters into negative yields on its bonds and negative interest rates, it's going to be a very, very interesting experiment. So there's, a, again, an interesting chart here from Arbor Data Science that showcases some different projection models. Now, it's a pretty widespread between these projection models, but they tell you basically what to look out for in these different scenarios. So they talk about the possibility of the 10-year yield in this case, which is a 10-year government bond or treasury in this case of the United States appears possible over the next five years when a recession hits and a global um, and globalization goes in reverse. So we start to see a rise in populism, uh, a decline in overall global trade, and we're seeing an increase in this case as well, and a, a pullback in the sense of the economy, uh, declining economic growth. These are the kind of symptoms we look for, for a possibility for the 10 year over the next five years to go negative. So again, we have these projection models here that showcase this over the chart here. This is the globalization contraction chart here. This is the worst case scenario here. So projecting some time between, uh, in this case, 2023, 2024, that there's a likelihood that we could see the current yield of 1.7% on the 10 year drop below zero and enter into negative territory. Some projection models are very optimistic as well, showcasing that we actually might get a spike here in the short term, that we might be able to get an increase in inflation, an increase in economic growth, and therefore see the yield turn positive. And not, well, we're already currently positive, but even more positive than where we are. So we've got these different models that are more me, uh, kind of in the moderate area. And I have to say that I really think that somewhere between this pink and red line is where we're really going to see it. I want to be a little bit more moderate. I don't want to say, you know, even the projections aren't telling you the truth that it's going to go down to zero soon. I think this takes time to get here, right? We can see here that over the last couple of years, since 2013, we've bounced in between this range for a while. The U.S., bear in mind, guys, is one of the strongest economic players in the sense of monetary policy and its ability to be flexible on monetary policy due to the recent massive tax cuts in the United States, the deregulation. It's been a pretty large environment for business, a very uh, solid environment for uh, small businesses and companies to come in. Even though the economic growth isn't as good as reported, on the global stage, it's the same exact scenario. The numbers are all fudged, guys, right? So important to keep this in mind. I would say that this chart is very, very valuable. Now, interestingly enough as well, there's something that's very important to keep in mind here as we talk a little bit about, uh, you know, again, this big debt bubble here and where we are at the moment and the cycle. Uh, for you know these credit cycles that we go through. Every eight to 10 years, we go through a credit cycle. We're actually overdue here for the peak of a credit cycle. And interestingly enough, if you look at the US Treasury debt, the average maturity for these debt, uh, so basically, in this case, uh, you get different variations on the maturity of debt due to basically what type of treasuries are being issued and being bought by investors, right? So if more people are taking shorter term debt or more people are taking maybe, for example, 10 year debt, this can lead to a fluctuation on the average maturity date. And for those of you who don't know what maturity is, maturity is when a bond 
our treasury in this case of the United States is finalized basically uh, it is basically paid down from the government over time the interest or the yield in this case has been paid out on this debt it's been basically closed off right so people hold debt usually to maturity you can sell bonds if you'd like to someone else but eventually those debts are those debts are going to be paid back and eventually will be matured they will have uh, got received the final principal payback for the IOU and then also the yield well Interestingly enough, we can see that there's some significant peaks and bottoms here between the average line here, which is 60 months. So let's go ahead and focus on where these peaks are. Well, we had a peak back here near 1989. You guys might know in 1989, uh, you know, or back here during the 80s more specifically, uh, we had a pretty significant pullback in equity markets here as well in 2000, all the way up here to 70 points. And then a dramatic pullback going all the way to 2008. And now we're seeing a turn here yet again since November of 2017, when central banks finally started to take significant measures to reduce quantitative easing, to reduce or increase interest rates, right? So starting to pull back those tools that stimulated the economy. And now we're starting to see a shorter term maturity date for these bonds, these treasuries. So very, very interesting chart here. Along with that as well, a probability of recession calculated by the yield curve. Uh, the yield curve, for those of you who may not know, is a measure between two different time periods of treasuries uh, and the yield on those treasuries. And when we see uh, basically that in the shorter term, you can get a higher yield than long-term yields, which again, doesn't make much sense. It speaks to a sense of fear in global debt. And we can see here, that over history, an inversion of the yield curve, a spike in the yield curve is usually a precursor or an immediate sign that we are in a recession of some sort, that the economy is slowing. It tends to be historically speaking that we get, um, if I remember correctly, about a 20, a 20 to 25% return in equities before we actually get a recession or a pullback in markets after the yield curve has inverted. And it usually takes a couple of months to really take into effect, sometimes up to a year. So. We've already got that inversion of the yield curve here, and it's growing to a pretty large degree. So now we're getting to the point where we should be on watch for a recession. Back here, we should have still given it some time. And again, we weren't calling for an immediate pullback, but again, we were bearish on equities because we started to realize that all of these indicators are showcasing that the benefits are being outweighed by the negatives, that the risk is outweighing any potential reward across global markets. And this, again, is coming at a time where we're seeing record levels of debt to GDP. This percentage mark here, this red line, shows us as a percentage of GDP, we are at a new high here of nearly 323 to 324% for debt to GDP. So for every dollar that exists in the economy for gross domestic product on a yearly basis, there are $3.25 worth of debt. Think about that. It's absolutely significant, guys. We have continued to grow our percentage of debt here. And the global debt we now have is sitting around under $260 trillion. When you aggregate government debt, credit, mortgage debt, it's a very, very interesting picture when you just put it here in this chart and keep it simple. We have a massive debt bubble on the global stage. And if we take a look here as well, we can look here that over the last few years, you know, we, we were talking about the real economy here, whether or not all this debt has really paid off. Take a look at the cumulative debt growth in the United States versus our actual underlying GDP. Back here in 2008, I don't think we really took the proper steps to stimulate the economy, to really lead to real economic growth. What we ended up doing was stimulating asset markets. We stimulated property markets. And for those of you who may not know, the bottom half of the United States, as an example, owns less than half a percentage of all assets that exist. That includes stocks, bonds, treasuries, mortgages, or properties in this case. So we basically financed the biggest asset bubble in history, and we did little to nothing to actually help the underlying economy. Banks are lending out at record lows compared to record highs. And it's more difficult now than ever in this case for a lot of individuals to actually be able to get out of a state of poverty in the United States. It's been like this for a while. It's because 
central bank monetary policy has not gone about actually fixing the underlying issues of the economy. Right? I could ramble on about this for a long time, guys. But a good little sign here, I think, that would really summarize it good is taking a look here at the default rate or the delinquency rate of credit card debt. This is usually one of the best telltale signs of where we are in our economy. And this is a measure between smaller banks and all commercial banks. Now we can see here we have a much more moderate level of delinquency, but we've increased by about nearly 50% here from 2015 upwards toward 2020. But for smaller banks, rather than larger banks, we can already see that we've surpassed the levels we had during the financial crisis in delinquency rates. It's pretty damn significant. So in summary, the growing debt, and more specifically, a growing number of debt in the U.S. economy, as well as the broader economy, that has negative yields, is putting us in a position where we are going to see people looking for alternative hedges, that are going to be looking for alternative investments or opportunities to put their wealth in something that has a fixed supply, a reducing inflation rate that is predetermined, pre-mathematically programmed into its protocol. Now, gold and silver historically have relatively reasonable levels of inflation or increase in the supply due to the historical record where we've seen that every year gold sur uh, supply or its stock to flow ratio has around an inflation rate of one to two percent for the last 200 years. But Bitcoin, in this case, is not only going to have a similar inflation rate after we initiate the halving event sometime in May of 2020, but after the words, in the next four years, we are going to have a better and more optimal stock to flow ratio for Bitcoin than gold, making Bitcoin the favorable store of value. And step by step, we are going to see that reflect in its price. Always bear in mind, guys, markets of scale here. Bitcoin right now is less than $200 billion in valuation. In fact, we can take a look at it right now. The valuation for Bitcoin is $166 billion. Gold is over $10 trillion in value now with the recent rally. What market do you think has the ability to 5x over the next two or three years? I'll leave that decision up to you. But if it happens to be that you're interested in cryptocurrency markets, you guys should definitely check out our sponsor, eToro. eToro is a really interesting platform that allows you to copy a variety of traders, including myself, as it's a social trading platform. And for those of you in the United States, you can copy my portfolio as well as the portfolio of many others. Just simply click on the View Stats button here on a profile that interests you. You can view their monthly stats, you can view their current portfolio holdings, as well as a chart of their previous performance. By clicking the blue Copy Trader button, you can copy alongside them real-time, trading at the exact same price and at the exact same time. But all in all, guys, I hope you all enjoyed this video. I think this is a very interesting topic. I don't really see many people talking about it because I'll be honest, at the end of the day, monetary policy, bond markets, I know it can sound a bit boring, but this is the fuel that's going to fire the next rally for cryptocurrencies. If you guys really wanna have an understanding, you have to have an understanding of this. And understand to a decent degree, how these topics uh, work in the real world and why they're relevant because we're talking about multi-trillion dollar markets that are the underlying plumbing of the financial economy as we know it all right so anyways that's it for the video of today today guys i've rambled on enough and thank you for putting up with me for today if you did like it however please drop a like leave a comment down below as to what you think about all that we discussed but until the next one i'll see you all in the next video stay tuned